we should probably get it rolling now. Uh, I'll do a little introduction. My name is Michael Kerner. Welcome to the Virtual Lens Summit. Uh, today we're going to have Master Built with my friends Tim and Lisa from Master Built Lenses. Really excited about this one. Most of you should have received a PDF booklet via email this morning, just about 10 minutes ago. So oh, okay. There were some bounce backs, I think, because of the size of the PDF file, but um, we'll see if we can maybe somehow attach it or in the chat, if you want the booklet, we can try resending it. Um, anyway, this is probably about our 12th Virtual Lens Summit. We're gonna take next week off on July 3rd. And then on July 10th, we're gonna have Hawk on with Wolfgang from Germany, which is gonna be super exciting. Um, so anyway, today we've got Master Belt Lenses and with honored guests, Eric Edwards and Bobby Bukowski, two of my favorite cinematographers. But I say that about any cinematographer on the <laughs> You better. <laughs> so anyway, uh, take it away, Tim. Hey, how's it going? Um, I think a lot of you have seen this already. We'll try to keep it as possibly non-boring as possible. I, I don't know if that is possible, but we'll see. Anyone who falls asleep, obviously, this is a good sure cure for insomnia. So you can record this. And if you have problems falling asleep at midnight, this is a great thing to watch. Um, I guess we'll go through the booklet first and talk about the lenses and then kind of talk about large format and then really just get through that kind of boring housekeeping and talk to Eric and Bobby after that, um, who have both had experiences with the master built, but also kind of more get a chance to talk about their, their shooting and their experiences through, gosh, many, many years now. Um, so, yeah. All right, um, and anyone who wants this booklet, I think you can either get it from Michael or he put it in the chat or he can email it to you so uh, you can look at it later. Um, again, if you have problems sleeping, this booklet is a definitely good thing to look at. It's in the, uh, chat. It's in the chat right now. Oh, it's That's in the chat, yeah, okay. it's in the chat. Yeah, and then someone said record. I, I think Michael is recording this, so you guys can, he'll post it somewhere after this. Yeah, it's being recorded and we're also, uh, going Facebook Live for the first time, which is uh, sort of fun. Cool. Ooh. Okay. Um, master built lenses. Uh, okay. This was a huge accident uh, to tell everybody the truth, how these lenses came by. Uh, um, so uh, I guess my experience and then Lisa's experience, um, I was a camera assistant for We're in 20, for 14 years, uh, 13 years, and I was an operator for seven years. Got to work with a lot of wonderful, wonderful DPs. Got to work with a lot of not so wonderful DPs, but uh, from all of that, I took a lot of experiences away. Um, started kind of delving into buying lenses about almost 10 years ago. So either I would rent them on shows I was on or they would live at a specific camera house and kind of just sub out of there or whatever. But through that experience and being on a set, got to find out a lot of uh, shortcomings of lenses. And then with large format coming along, that was a huge kind of um, renaissance too, to learn more about lenses and what people wanted and what cinematographers were expecting from them. Obviously, the trend was very much going towards vintage, even about, I'd say, hugely predominantly going towards vintage was almost eight years ago and stuff with Leicas and K35s and FDs and uh, Cook Speed Pancros, of course, and Kawas and Baltars and Super Baltars. So definitely bought a lot of those sets and started working with those and just shot, saw their shortcomings. I don't know if you could call them their shortcomings, but... Um, a lot of notes I got from cinematographers that were starting to shoot large format and talking to me about lenses and things like that were just consistency. People wanted, you know, lenses that were the same stock. They wanted, you know, color rendition to match throughout the set. Obviously, you don't see that in K35s. Obviously, you don't see that in Super Baltars or Kawas. As wonderful they, as they are and as beautiful as the images they make, um, they have a lot of growing pains to them. So. Um, after kind of doing a lot of work with uh, Larry Scher for Joker uh, for the lenses on that, um, got a lot of notes from him, which were absolutely wonderful and from other DPs. And what kind of spawned out of that is, hey, if we're shooting large format, 
there are some things we want to stick to, um, you know, having consistency through the lenses and the T-stop and uh, the size and the format and how the assistant works with it. But we don't want to give up any of the look. We want the look. Um, and that's been pretty important. So out of that came the master builds. Uh, the first prototype kind of came out last summer, 2019. We're a very, very young company. Basically, it kind of even haven't launched the, we haven't officially launched the company, as stupid as that sounds. Um, so, and then Lisa Hart came on last year um, when I pretty much knew that uh, I couldn't handle the business. Uh, and yeah, and then Lisa's experience is, I'll let her talk about that. Oh boy, okay. Hello everyone, Lisa Harp. A um, little bit of experience. I was with Panavision out of the Hollywood office for about 28 years. And then I went on from there to Airy Rental for a year and have experienced a lot of issues with some vintage lenses from the rental house side of things as far as durability and you know many times having a cinematographer come in and say this is the look i want hey crew make it work and you know for many years my job then was with the crew to make sure that it did work that once they got on set they had lenses that um you know common front element gears in the same place, things that just made their life easy as opposed to some of the old school lenses that had nothing in common and life on set was misery for them. So it was, I had a few years with what I brought to the table with Tim as far as what rental houses needed with making lenses that could sustain in a rental environment and be durable yet absolutely beautiful, sustainable, and, you know, be something that the industry needed, which was very exciting for me because we got to do something as a full process as opposed to a fix on existing. We got to do ground up and, you know, how could you not get involved with something like that? It was great. Yeah, okay. Uh, Okay, and pushing along here, and obviously even using vintage lenses, it's not always a crazy nightmare because there's really, really great companies that do really, really great rehousings. But at the end of the day, it's hard to take a 40 to 50 year old Kawa and get a matching set or, you know, uh, uh, K35s where the 18 even works or the 55s not yellow or, you know, there, you know, obviously there are, um, kind of special sets that are nice and everything, but they're far and in between. So that's what the master builds came up with. So after that, that's the history and background. Next thing is, and we'll make this go a lot faster, guys. I know this is boring stuff. Uh, the research, development, innovation, execution. So we are based in Los Angeles. We are a super small company. So that gives us a couple of advantages. We're absolutely brave and stupid enough to kind of listen to anybody who wants to give us input and we'll try to instill that. So if someone has a, you know, someone says, wow, I'd like the lens to do this, or is there a possibility to do this? We jump on it. You know, if it's, uh, there's kind of no timeline or schedule where we don't, you know, we have to wait for the office to open back up or something. Um, we can jump on it right away. Um, that's been pretty important, especially with the cinematographers we've been talking to and the shows we've been on. We've been really fortunate to have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stable of guys talking to us and uh, letting us know what they want from the lenses. So we started with the classic set. Then we moved on for a, a large Apple TV show It's called C. They shoot in Toronto. They're shooting season two and three back to back. Um, we have many sets on that and those two cinematographers, Michael and Brian came to us early on and they're like, hey, we shoot a lot of Alexis, our, our, our cameras, Alexis 65 on this show and we carry five to six of them. And there's times where we will shoot five or six of them. Yes, I hate it. It's not great <laughs> for lighting, but sometimes we have to do what we got to do and we're outside and either D or E camera will get caught up in an 18K or they'll see the sun and we want a way to kind of control flare better and it has to come from the lens. We just, you know, 
there's only so much we can do by putting uh, up, you know, and I think those guys literally carry construction cranes and 200 by 200 fly swatters with negative fill and silk um, in combination. So they have a good control, but there's times they just can't control five cameras. So we came up with a soft flare for them. And then the soft flare becoming really popular. We've uh, done that for other people and people use the classics and the soft flares in uh, tandem. And then after that had um, kind of people suggest zooms. So we were started working on zooms and as well as uh, our ultra 65, which covers way beyond the Lexus 65 open gate and goes to super Panavision and uh, some IMAX. And we'll talk about those. So yeah, we definitely tried to research and develop and innovate and execute in a very, very small timeline with a good group of uh, cinematographers. And we're always, always open to speaking to cinematographers and uh, hearing their input. Okay, next page. All right. So this, you guys, if you guys want to look at this coverage and format page, you can. It's the total snoozer. The important thing about this is we really don't go by image circle. Uh, we've heard good and bad from that. What we do is either take every single camera, sensor, or film gate that we are uh, basically driving our lenses towards, be it IMAX or 15 per film or Alexis 65 or Fuji GFX or, or Sony Venice. And we test our lenses on every single camera, sensor, or film gate. Um, and we don't accept like image circle or any of uh, printed information. We're pretty stubborn in that way. If we don't see it ourselves, we don't quote it as being coverage or our light path or corners being transmitted. Uh, we just test everything ourselves. Um, so that's what this format and coverage uh, chart is about. Um, super boring. Uh, next thing. Okay. Oh, we missed the page. F. Okay, that's my fault. Shit. People the love those charts, page. Tim. People love those charts. They're not. Okay, boring. then they're <laughs> masochists, <laughs> I guess, or super, super nerds. Yeah, but yeah, you can charts. have that chart's on there. You guys can download it and look at it. So. We'll come back. Can you find that other, uh, the old booklet and maybe we can come back to it uh, at the end, uh, Lisa, for that design page? Because that's pretty important. But, oh, huh. yeah, my fault. Um, so these are the classics. These are the first, uh, this is the first set we started with. It's 18 through 135 with uh, more uh, focal length coming. Um, so they're all the same size, all 114 fronts. Um, Focus and everything falls in the same place. You can put clip-on map boxes on it. It's a, a durable system. Um, so the next page is some of the tests. So these are black and white. Uh, there's color tests as well. Um, we're coming out with more, um, but why they're black and white is so you can simply see what the lens is doing. Um, so you see the flare. Basically what we're trying to create is a flare that's natural to the eye as well as natural to the sensor or to the film plane of the camera. Um, all of these are, I wouldn't even say exaggerated flares, but enhanced. There's no map box. We're looking for the sun to pin the lens right away. And you see that 25 mil, how it's reacting, and then the 50 mil, um, and then the 105, just kind of creating a flare you would see by your eye on set that day um, is what we're going for. We're not trying to find like an artificial flare or anything. And this flare comes mainly from the way we hand polish um, each element and the front element and the surfaces and what we do to it. It's a proprietary system um, that took about almost a year to formulate, but uh, this is a flare you'll almost kind of see only from the uh, master builds. And then on the bottom right hand corner, you see a pretty telling image of what the master builds try to do. So um, the optical path or what people uh, refer to as tuning these days um, and what, how we modify the optical path creates a few things, creates the flare, creates the fall off. But most importantly, it creates this three dimensional image. And this becomes really important in large format so what you see in the cityscape is a concentration in the background where you can still kind of see buildings, city lights, car headlights, uh, construction signs, but then in the third of the frame, 
you see this incredible sharpness and richness to the image of uh, what's in what's actually in focus. Um, and that's an important thing. It's how the lens represents the out of focus area, not only in the background, but in the foreground. So the master belts represent out of focus areas uh, the same way. They're both natural. There's no artificial look to them. Sometimes you'll get a, you know, very clearly, very honestly, there's Zeiss lenses out there, there's Canon lenses out there from more modern manufacturers that create an out of focus area that is created on an MTF chart and they homogenize their lenses, their focal lengths from the widest to the telephoto to all kind of do one um, look and optimize those for MTF. We don't do that. We optimize towards a camera sensor so every lens has a more natural kind of fall off to it. So what I compare it to is sometimes you see background fall off or how it represents out of focus areas and it looks artificial, almost looks like a green screen. You don't see with that with the master built. They have a kind of organic rounded fall off and uh, uh, background out of focus to them. And that comes from us, us not optimizing on MTF for computers, but uh, doing it towards camera sensors. And we usually actually calibrate towards black and white uh, for our contrast. So we keep the blacks black and the whites white. And that's another thing you see in the master built is uh, we, don't, we don't reduce contrast. I know a lot of people go, oh, we don't want contrast or sharpness in lenses. You want contrast to sharpness in lenses. You just need to be able to control it, especially contrast, because if you're shooting in kind of one of these scenes, like a night exterior and that asphalt, you know, you go into post and you're trying to crush that black and it's just not black. Um, and then either a skin tone goes red or green because you're pushing it so far trying to regain that black. That's the problem with having lenses that don't create um, contrast. Okay. Um, God, if anybody really wants me to shut up and kind of go on to something else and not get so in depth into this, raise your hand or in the chat, tell me to shut up and I'll go a lot faster. Uh, next is the soft flares. So the soft flares are still 18 to 135 and same lenses. Now this is what we're doing here is the, um, Polished all the all the elements that we polished previously in the classics, we still polish. But there is a very very proprietary uh, kind of uh, special single. I wouldn't even say it's a single layer uh, coating. It's a coating basically used from the 60s and 70s, um, and you can see it. So what we're doing with the soft flares is creates a more kind of unrefined edge to the flares. They're not so uh, defined and the contrast is also um, softer when you get hit by light. Um, what's important is um, when you do get hit or pinned by light um, on any of the master belts, but specifically the soft flare, is you don't get a cast of green or a cast of whatever color the multi-coating is creating that infects the image. You'll see that in many modern lens manufacturers where the uh, image will veil over. So that's something that's really hard to get out of post. You can do it, but then you're affecting the rest of the image in the skin tone. So if you go to some of these images, you will see that the flare kind of con comes through in its own way with either green, yellow, purple, or magenta. But the overall image is still keeping its own integrity. Um, so all her skin tones and the integrity of her skin tone and the natural look that we captured on set is still there. These 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 images aren't um, haven't been uh, drastically altered, if at all. I think they're literally log out of the camera, um, so you're seeing what it is. So you can still regain any of that contrast and uh, anything you want in the skin tone. Um, Matthew Duclos, is it a mag fluoride coating? Nope. We don't do mag fluoride coating. Uh, mag fluoride coating was more on, um, I believe, the early Baltars, some Astro Berlins, um, things in the studio age where um, uh, cinematographers were trying to look for more clarity in them. We don't use a mag fluoride. I guess what we would use is more what you would compare to early Panavision C-series and early Panavision Super Panavision. 
So kind of what we have is this coating. So you'll see that in the soft flares is a magenta look to it. And um, if you see this kind of coating reflect here, you'll see that same in the soft flare. Uh, same here. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so single coatings aren't always mag fluoride. There's uh, what Panavision's been using for many years, either like BK7 or JK7, depending on the formulation of the front grouping. So um, that gives you more blue flare where we have a kind of more amber, yellow, golden, uh, green flare to it. So um, also that helps us kind of keep away from it infecting any of the image or giving it an overall cast. Uh, but yeah, you can do single layer coatings that aren't uh, always mag fluoride. But mag fluoride is a gorgeous, gorgeous vintage uh, kind of coating you'll see on Baltars, uh, uh, Astro Berlin's, some other things. Oh, um, Canon FDs, you'll, you'll see that in some of those as well. So turn, turn the turn of the 70s, you saw a lot of mag fluoride. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Stephen and Matthew. Yeah, you see them on Lomos. Depends on the focal length. Uh, I don't think they were always that. And also a lot of Lomos you see these days have had um, uh, um, recoded. So, and sometimes they recode it with mag fluoride. Okay, next thing. Um, da, 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 what is the next set the series of lenses. Maybe we're going to ultra six. Oh, the zooms. Okay. So the zooms will have four uh, eventually. Right now we have the 25 to 75 and the 45 to 135. These were created. We never set out to make zooms. Um, I didn't want to make zooms. They're arduous. They're never kind of matched the uh, the set, um, people always go, oh, can the Zoom be a brother or sister to the set? I think it's a cousin. Um, we got pretty close with our Zooms, um, but it is hard to match, but I think we got as close as we could. Um, so going to some of these, uh, what is the donor glass for the Zooms? There is a lot of uh, ingenue glass in there, but we use other stuff as well. Um, so. As you see, so here are, um, these samples are pretty new. So what you see is basically a 25, 50, and 75 are what we try to um, kind of push for to match the, the rest of the set. So the um, master build zooms are gonna uh, be more matched to the classic set. So if you look at that first image there, the black and white on the top left there, you kind of see a flare that is very much matching to the 25 classic. You know, it's coming down, it has that spherical kind of uh, diagonal cross to it there. Um, so you see the sun just creeping in there. What's important though is there is no bounce on her right now. There is no light all, and there's even that asphalt is black. So nothing's pushing her black back, but um, the lens is, definitely keeping all that resolution and contrast uh, in there. And that sky's on fire. That's um, probably 25 minutes to the sun ball being uh, dead on the horizon there. And as much as her hair is trying to cover it, it's still seeping in there. So that left frame and that right frame, you're uh, definitely kind of preserving the sky, which is pretty hard, but that comes from the formulation of the lens. Um, and then if we kind of zoom out a little bit and see what's another good example. Um, and that's a 25 mil, that one. And then, yeah, if you go to that color picture of her on that glass there, so you're getting a huge amount of kickback from uh, the reflection of the glass she's leaning on, as well as outside the patio door. Um, again, there's no fill here. I guess you can say the glass reflection of the table is the fill, um, but everything's coming through in kind of a clear, uh, good, uh, precise way. You have a, some sharpness there in the center and then the fall off there in the sides. Um, and then the next page is a few more um, examples from the zoom. Oh, there you go, okay. Yeah, so there's a couple good examples there. Um, again, how it's creating contrast and holding contrast. There's no fill on her. So if you go to that one on the bottom left with her kind of looking straight into the camera, 
So pretty important. It's hard to shoot human beings at a 25 mil and large format without kind of either making them look funny or too wide. Um, we're preserving the blue sky here. You have gradation through the blue sky and then through the sun ball. That's pretty important. And kind of, this is pinned wide open at a four, but uh, a lot of people have been testing this zoom um, kind of always uh, point to how remarkable even at its T4, the separation we have in the lens. And uh, yeah, that goes to, it doesn't, um, iris doesn't always, and T-stop doesn't correlate to the depth of field and the separation. So you see that this is a great example here. Um, so yeah, so that's the Zoom. Any other questions you guys have about the Zoom or its limited availability or complaints about it, I'd definitely ask. Um, I think next is Ultra 65. Yeah, okay. So super, super excited about Ultra 65. Definitely doing some things that um, other companies aren't doing even for their, own, uh, for their own camera system. So when C, uh, the Apple TV show C uh, originally came to us, they're like, great, absolutely. But we shoot strictly open gate uh, Alexa 65, which is almost a two to one ratio. Um, it's a little, there's actually, it's a little wider than that. There's a little less headroom. But their thing is, hey, the widest lens we have that does that now is um, a DNA 28 mil uh, uh, T3 lens, or I think they call it a 2.8. Um, so uh, Michael, the cinematographer from that said, you know, we have a lot of sets. Um, where's the place they shot at in Toronto, Lisa, that we went to, that, that scary factory? The Hearn, it was called The Hearn. The it? Hearn. Mm -hmm. And it used to be, it's a de decommissioned coal, uh, coal what was it? Or a water refinery. treatment, maybe? Yeah. Um, super scary, but this thing is about 100 acres. Um, it's about floor to ceiling, almost 70 uh, feet kind of up and down. Um, and uh, he's like, you know, would love a fast lens that is super wide that covers the Lexus 65. So we came up with a 21 mil T18 Ultra 65 which is pretty special in what it does. Um, uh, again, asking about image circle. Yes, we will get to that image circle. The Ultra 65s cover pretty much as, as big as any lens is gonna cover sensor-wise. So if you punch into that Ultra 65, Lisa, uh, what you're seeing here uh, that's pretty important is a few things. So this actual image was shot on Fuji GFX 100, which is a 100 megapixel camera, which is a three by two sensor, which is bigger than Alexa 65. Let's go to that cityscape of Century City. I know that's a beautiful image of Jess we, that we want to look at. We'll come back to that. Um, so this was shot on GFX 100. It's a three by two sensor, which is almost 9,000 by 7,000 pixels. Um, pretty massive and three by two is there's something to be said for that so what you're seeing in this image that's pretty special is the road going up on the left here is straight and the road going to the right there is straight and then the windows and the buildings nothing's converging um i wouldn't say there's zero distortion to this lens you can't say that about any lens uh, no matter how much you want to say it but wide open there is a really minimal amount. And then you still have this gorgeous fall off in that tree. So that tree is 20 feet away, but the building is 100 yards away. But what's important about that is um, you're still seeing the perspective and the fall off. And even in that railing there of the, of the sidewalk going up there, perspective becomes super important in large format. So, and then also distortion. So this lens on Super 35 is almost a 10 millimeter. Um, no one can do that with uh, the distortion control on this. Um, there's, if you put it on a projector, there's gonna be distortion, but um, on an image sensor still, it's controlled pretty well. So we're pretty proud of that, um, yeah. Uh, question, are the Ultra 65 lenses based on the Vista version versions modified for large image circle? 
the entire um, rear optical block is absolutely uh, new to us. So uh, yeah, great job on that one, rectilinear. Is it rectilinear? Gosh, rectilinear is a funny term. It's like jumbo shrimp. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it is, we try to control distortion really well. And I'd say come test it or look at it or we'll give you more image samples. Um, on a grid if you'd like, but I think that image kind of speaks for mostly what we're trying to do. What's the lineup of Ultra 65 series? Gosh, Viola, you should just take over this thing because absolutely we should, I should shut up and mention those things because those are what you want to know about. It's a 21 mil, a 29 mil, a 45 mil, and a 65 mil, and they're all T18. And the important thing about those are, those are all really kind of magic numbers, I guess uh, is a silly way to call it, but um, in ultra, in, in Super Panavision 70 and IMAX and things like that, lenses are formulated in such a way that they do a number of things and the focal lengths, you know, um, kind of get these weird numbers to them. But the way you formulate that lens and that light path and the optical path and what you're doing with the lens is gonna di dictate its own field of view and its own millimeter size. So these are all natural numbers to larger format. And these lenses aren't only for large format. We have clients going into bigger shows shoot, shooting large format, but we also have clients going into shooting normal full frame and they're just mixing these in with classics and software. Um, so yeah, we're getting these ready for a couple shows coming up for uh, DPs that we've been working with for uh, quite a while now from the beginning of Master Build. Um, so yeah, the Ultra 65s are absolutely, um, we're super excited about them. And then, yeah, and then the great thing is if you go to that image that has the um, flare in it, the 45 mil, um, something important. So 45 mil on Ultra 65, how we're shooting it on the GFX, becomes only almost a 25 millimeter on Super 35, um, or 20 millimeter actually. And you're shooting a person from below. First of all, I don't know any actress or model that wants to be shot from below on a wide lens, but you see it doesn't take away from the beauty. Yeah, a lot of that is the subject. It's, it's hard to make her look bad, but as much as I tried, I couldn't. Um, so it's a testament to the lens. Um, and then if you go to that 21 or 29 mil, and then the awesome thing about shooting large format is getting to shoot people kind of all up in their face. So we're about three or four feet from her right now. And there's no exaggeration to her nose or to her eyes or to her lips. Um, and what you get here is you get to see a lot of background action and a lot of background concentration and information while still having her kind of predominant in the frame. And I know that's a lot of trend of what people are shooting these days is kind of shooting actors up close and still getting to see what's going on in the background or kind of getting a scope of the background. And then if you go up to the 65 mil ultra 65, um, it just becomes a gorgeous portraiture lens. Um, you have that look to it, that classic look. You have that highlight on her hair. You know, that highlight is probably four to five stocks over, but we're still preserving that contrast. So that's super important to us through all the uh, master builds. Okay, last page is the portrait lens, I think. Um, right now we have one portrait lens. It is this one. Uh, yeah, it's a 100 mil T14. Um, coming up with hopefully a 55 T14. Um, so that's this, kind of working on that right now still. Uh, so what you see here is kind of, we went for creating an image that was very much reminiscent of 20s and 30s photography. Um, definitely uh, studio photography from like MGM and Warner Brothers and George Harrell and things you would see like that. Um, so what you're getting here is like the bokeh and the swirly background is usually referred to as a Petzl background. That's a lens, a Russian lens from the Soviet uh, era in the 20s and 30s. Um, but what you do, so what we've done is also created this lens to where one four is a look, two is a look, and two eight is a look. And you can see how drastically 
the image kind of um, creates its own look at those different stops. I personally like it at a two and a two eight quite a bit, but I know a lot of people want to shoot it wide open and pin it at a one four. And it's just a gorgeous look to it. It's um, portraiture look, a portrait lens has always kind of been important for uh, Panavision uh, earlier in the days, um, especially when the Primo series came out. Um, there was so much beauty in those lenses and they created what was called, um, I might get this wrong here. When I was an assistant, I knew it. They had, the Primos came out with something called a classic soft and a portrait lens. Um, the classic soft actually had a knob on it where you unscrewed the knob and you could kind of tune the lens in and out and we would do, it would uh, shift the spacing and the air gap throughout it. And it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous lens. Um, I know Sam Bayer really used those a lot and a lot of fashion guys and a lot of hair commercials and a lot of uh, Maybelline. God, that's dating myself, Maybelline. I don't know if they're still around, uh, Lisa, and uh, Revlon, and a lot of time the cosmetic commercials would shoot portraiture lens. But yeah, um, for us, portrait lens was just fun to do. So we, um, we kind of went down that path. Will it be a success? I don't know. I've shown it to a couple people that have really loved it. Um, but yeah, uh, David is making a comment or has a question. Petsville is a bit older than that and it was designed in my native Vienna. Yeah, the Petsville goes back to, yeah, um, basically photography and film nitrate and negative. Um, but it's really kind of predominant in the Soviet Union was I think in the 20s and 30s where um, they came out with three focal lengths, I believe was a 37 millimeter, an 82 millimeter and a 58 millimeter. Um, and that's where you see this swirly background that people call a Petsville. So yeah, awesome, awesome, David, if you're a big fan of a uh, Petsville, if you have any comments or other kind of fun facts on that, we'd love to hear it. That swirly bouquet is truly reminiscent of the older days, love it. Okay, cool, good. Um, yeah, and if you're in LA area or you wanna see any more tests of these, maybe we can shoot more tests or if you wanna demo it, please drop us a uh, email, which we'll put in the chat. It's I think masterbuiltlenses at gmail.com. So all the primes are original optics and zooms use some donor glass. Nope, not always, not always the case. Um, all the primes use absolute, um, modern glass that that we source um, we don't use any vintage glass it's not a, a rehousing um, and that's how we keep them consistent and what we can do is basically we can control the look 100 percent because uh, we're using all brand new optics the optics we use are from japan no huge secret same optics panavision is using same factory that makes uh glass for a lot of people not many people are pouring glass these days themselves um, uh, obviously the bigger brands, um, you know, some claim to be pouring it, but uh, a lot of the glass is getting poured at, uh, we'll pour it at one uh, factory and it's amazing, wonderful glass um, and it's what you do with it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, there. So yeah, we use um, all modern glass and then the Zooms use a variety of things. The portrait uh, uses a variety of things. So uh, no big secrets. Uh, yeah, we just, uh, we're doing what a lot of we're using a lot of glass other people are using and it's just kind of what we do with it and for better or worse um the look of the master builds come from us so if you hate them you can blame us if you like them you can blame us uh but the rhyme or reason to them isn't um it is not a uh is definitely proprietary because it comes from us so yeah, that could be a good thing or bad thing, but the way we cook our hamburger is super different from anybody else. So if you like what it is, great, or you want to know what's in it, that's great too. It's, uh, so yeah, um, what's next? Okay, any anybody want us to just like uh, kind of go to anything else? Uh, I'm based in Switzerland. Any chance to rent them out here in Europe? Yeah, actually, um, there are a couple of places in Europe uh, getting sets coming up soon. And is that what job is was in Switzerland that was going with Master? Was it in Switzerland or was he in Norway? Where was that other guy? Lisa? He was in Norway. It was an HBO was TV show in Norway. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, they're starting. So yeah, definitely getting in Europe, getting into South America. We're in Canada. We're in, wait, North America is, is Canada and the USA. I don't know what your political views are, but I, I will just go ahead and say we're there in Canada and in USA. I don't know if that's the right term or you guys want to hear that. Um, so yeah, they're getting out everywhere. And in Europe, we can give you a list of places they will be. And um, if you're based in Switzerland, also just go to your camera house and ask them if uh, they want to see these and we can send, uh, we can set up something. So, okay. Do we want to go to that large format book, Michael, or raise, I guess guys, raise your hands if you're bored and you want to kind of go on to hearing Eric and Bobby. We can talk a little bit more if you'd like, Tim. And are you can, sure? Hold on. I'm going to go know. through and see can, how many people are raising their hands that they're yeah, going maybe. to go to something else. Bobby, are you raising <laughs> your hand? Eric, are you raising your hand? Are you guys super bored yet? No, I'm good. Enjoying it. Okay. You guys are yeah. masochists. All right. Good. <laughs> um, Okay, I guess you want to bring up that large format book? We'll punch through that sucker really fast. Okay, I don't have it downloaded. Give me one minute. Okay. You know what? Real quick, uh, uh, any other question? Oh, hold on. There's a question here. Oh, are there any sets in Mexico? Uh, we are working on that. We are working on Mexico City. We are working on a few places. Uh, where exactly in Mexico are you, Alberto? Um, next, Max, can you talk about the mechanics a bit more? Yep. How do these focus? Yep. Is the design using cams and cam followers or something else? Yeah, Max. So big, big deal for us. We're using threads and cams. Uh, we're doing a variety of combinations. Uh, that's to make them more robust and to have maintenance be more simple. Also for shipping, um, there's a few lenses out there. Uh, if you're a lens person, you definitely understand what lenses these are. If you get a cam that's super, super, super smooth, super loose, that's great. Um, but it just doesn't need to be that smooth or that loose, um, especially since most people are using Preston's or remote focus. Early on, um, Lisa and I went to Preston and we went to Howard Preston and we gave him the lenses and we stood there. And for about two or three hours, he mapped every single lens we had um, and, uh, and this is more Alana or Howard can actually kind of speak to this point, but I will paraphrase and I will try to be as objective as possible. He said it was one of the best lenses he's mapped in many, many, many years, meaning it's accuracy, it's backlash, it's mechanics, it's image shift were absolutely right on and exact. Um, now you get lenses that have a totally cam based system that are super super loose you know you can breathe on them and and they'll and they'll and they'll uh rack focus um which is great what you do get from that is you don't need that loose loose greased feel always um so if weather's changing you get kind of a thought process there um but you do need some resistance and feel especially if you're using remote focus so what we do is uh, we have very, very fine threads that we use a very neutral, neutral grease on. So in Toronto, in zero degrees, these were working perfectly. And in a desert shoot uh, about a few months ago where it was 110 degrees, it was, they were working perfectly. We don't change out the grease or anything. Um, there is a benefit to changing out grease. Panavision has always been known, especially for 11 to ones, depending on where you're shooting, you're using the, uh, different grease and uh, uh, velocity for what the uh, circumstances are. So we kind of just try to take a neutral look to that. And our threads are incredibly, incredibly well-maintained. The cams are, are tighter than that for tolerance. So we keep trying to keep everything to a very zero tolerance. Um, so yeah, that, that helps image shift, backlash, and accuracy and kind of all our focusing and, uh, and our marks. Um, our marks, if you ever look at the lenses, are incredibly precision based. We do everything with a deep engraver, the way kind of lenses have been engraved for many, many, many years. Um, we don't use laser. Everything's done on projector. Everything's done by eye and it by hand. Um, and then rechecked and checked and rechecked and checked on cameras. 
back on projectors and collimators. So yeah, um, I don't know if I gave you way too much of uh, uh, answers, Max. I know I did. Uh, okay, next. I'm new with your lineup and I was wondering if you're going the anamorphic route. Ah, uh, yeah, way too early for that. We are, we barely can handle our own lives and go to the grocery store. So um, yeah, we're working mm -hmm. on spherical right now and we really, really, um, we believe that spherical large format fast lenses with character that are tunable and have 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 specific personality to them is pretty important right now. And you'll we'll, we'll talk about that more with this large format thing. But um, how large format came about was very much spherical in in, in its sense in Super Panavision especially um, and Vista Vision for Paramount. So yeah, we're sticking to spherical right now. So uh, anamorphic is definitely something we're researching. Uh, cinematographers are asking about us every day. Um, they love the master built look. They're like, hey, just slap on a uh, anamorphic filter on there and we'll take it. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll Velcro it on there and when uh, they're ready, we'll let you know. And, uh, they'll be on Amazon. Um, so yeah, still yeah. working on that. What are your plans for the Zooms? Oh, that's a good question, Michael. And I, I think you know the answer. Unfortunately, that's why you're asking. We are, um, they will possibly be rental only. Um, and then uh, houses that already have master builts are who the priority goes to. Um, we're working on that uh, because it's uh, just limited to the glass right now. We wanted to create something that was as close to the look as possible. So the Ultra 65 and the Zooms, we're working on and we're going to hopefully get more of them out there. So I guess in a month and a half, ask us that question and uh, you'll get the same cop out answer, but uh, maybe we'll have a little more information. Uh, Matthew Duclos, can you talk about longevity and service options for owners? Yeah, okay, so we are based in Los Angeles. Um, I'll tell you the God's honest truth. Every single set we've had out and working and bought by anybody we have not had back for service yet um camera houses keslo keslo scratched something got scratched the rear element got scratched they sent that back to us and they wanted some uh just cleaning and service they sent that back to us but um out of all the sets that are out there they've maintained pretty well are there gonna, are there options for service and maintenance yep you can send them to us or we're happy to definitely start working with incredibly incredibly well revered and reliable uh, places like Duplos or other places to talk about um, service options. Yes, I know you're not fishing for a plug. Why would you f fish for a plug, Matthew? You guys are too busy already, but I understand a wonderful place like Duplos would ask that question. And uh, yeah, so service options right now, we are in Los Angeles and everything can be sent to Los Angeles or we're working uh, and talking to other people uh, presently as well. I know Michael, you maintain, Carrie maintains your set. They're pretty simple. We designed them to be pretty simple and maintained. And that comes from working with Panavision for many, many years. And also Lisa understanding, you know, downtime with lenses is lost money. And an owner operator definitely doesn't want that. And a rental house doesn't want that. So we definitely try to create a uh, system that's um, simple. Which other focal lengths are you planning to release? Ooh, Fernando, gosh, that's a good question. Um, we are working on, that's why the Ultra 65 has a 21, a 29, 45, and a 65. We plan on doing other focal lengths, um, hopefully a 180, hopefully a 40, hopefully a 65. But um, yeah, right now the Ultra 65s are really keeping us busy as well as just getting orders uh, fulfilled still that are coming in right now, believe it or not and uh, for stuff from February. Uh, Michael Kerner, will they be a limited run or more widely available? I think you're talking about the Zooms. Yeah, the Zooms are gonna be kind of a limited run. Um, we'll make as many as we can because we're, we're making Zooms kind of only to support people shooting the primes at this point. Um, so uh, we'll try to make as many as we can, but the primes are our, our, our primary focus are the soft layers, the classics and the ultra 65s and the portrait series right now. Okay, uh, large format cinematography. Uh, oh, one thing, Tim, I wanted to interrupt. Um, yeah. I don't think you, unless I missed it. 
I think it's important to mention uh, the attractive price point of the lenses. Just to oh, gosh. a little plug. So. Oh. I mean, it's there. It's a good price point. Yeah, I mean, so. if you guys want to hear about the price, I we really, I, I don't want to be selly or use car salesman or or, or 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 oh god or snake oil. If you guys want to know the prices, I, I think they're objectively priced. I think everyone we tell the price to is almost kind of surprised they're so reasonably or relatively affordable for what they are email us and we can send you the price um yeah i, I right we don't want to i don't want to advertise or kind of no 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 I, i'm not goal. saying that yeah. i'm just saying you know it's not like they're yes I can tell you, you know, they are not, not two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars for a set. They exactly. are ex incredibly, relatively well priced, and that comes from. I'll tell you the God's honest truth. What it comes from is, out of the three hundred or four hundred some odd lenses I've bought in the last ten years, ROI, return of in, uh, of investment, has been so 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 important to me. Um, and these were always priced in a place where. I thought they would be a good investment for either a DP or a consigner or a camera house. And that was important to me um, going into this project was, are they going to be accessible? Because the thought process is, I don't want these sitting on a shelf. We want them out there with wonderful DPs and cinematographers and filmmakers making images. If your product's not out there making images, I, I think it's, it's, you've already failed is really my is the only thought process on it um so yeah if you guys want prices email us masterbuiltlenses at gmail i think is the email i don't email yes. i don't email us so i don't know really know um, and if you want to throw that address in the chat uh they can they can call us uh they can contact us and uh if we tell you the price and you tell us we're expensive bastards then okay great we we will understand that and if you tell us they're too cheap we understand that we're not changing the price so you can um there it is what it is uh da, 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 da. okay what to the ultra 65s go for for an estimation yeah we don't sell those these those will only be through limited uh partners in specific markets so like in the pacific northwest in los angeles and new york and Dallas and Chicago, there'll be uh, special camera houses that will be able to support um, larger format cameras, be it uh, something that's coming out or Alexa 65, and those will be rental items because uh, Ultra 65s are, we will run out of steam per se of how many of those we can make. It will be a limited run uh, because the optics, all the optics come from a different, different uh, streams and different uh, venues and different generations. Okay, uh, explain more of polishing the front surface. Okay, yeah, so what we do is a basically a hand polish. Do we polish them by hand? No. Um, we don't put them on a machine where a hundred of them are done, done at one time. It's a very methodical process. Uh, we came up with it and once we kind of formulated the exact look we wanted, we. Uh, have that measured on an infrared thermometer, which is an incredibly, incredible, incredibly accurate and expensive uh, route to take. But once we had that formula, we had it. So every uh, uh, element or the elements that we polish are hand polished um, to exact degree where they make the look we make. And what that does is it affects the contrast and the flare of the um, lens and uh, it's the first thing you'll see in the lens so you'll see the classics have nothing you can it's the almost mirrored image so what you see in the front element actually if you're looking at the front element and you see a flare is the exact same image you're seeing on the sensor so what it does it creates this organic image um so we don't prioritize light rays in rgb like modern uh, lenses with multi coatings everything goes in at the same time. So you're getting this very raw image. So if you're in a mixed light situation, say in Hell's Kitchen on 11th Avenue in New York at nighttime with sodium vapors and white light and a tungsten light and even daylight kind of streams coming through there from headlights or halogens, you're getting an organic image that kind of takes all that color space and uh, gives you everything at one time. 
So if that, hopefully that answers your question, Eric. If not, we can go more into it. Uh, Adam, with the new Airy 4K Super 35 coming, you don't know that. You don't know that, but yes, uh, <laughs> uh, eventually you will probably see that camera. Are you going to give some more affordable lenses that have smaller image circle? You know, right now, Adam, we are 100% committed to full frame and not only that larger format, um, but all these lenses obviously cover Super 35. And that new Airy camera is slightly larger than Super 35. It's what they kind of set out to do with the original Alexa is where there's 10% space. So in the old film days, and I will show you something. Um, this is what they call a film gate. This is out of a Panavision camera behind me. Um, so that's a film gate. So the hole you see in there is not super 35, is not 185, is not four by three. So that's an entire full aperture gate. So the image sees, the negative saw all of that. So like the new camera uh, that Alexa, that they're making, uh, super 35 lenses, not all of them on the wide end, wide open will actually cover. So it's like shooting like 8K helium. You need a little more coverage to co cover full aperture. So what we're doing is we're still sticking to that um, uh, larger image circle, if you want to call it image circle, but larger sensors and larger aperture. So everything we do is by aperture and is by the actual sensor or film gate. We don't take anything for chance. We don't take any published specs for chance. Um, we put all the lenses on there and either shoot a uh, test or take my micrometers and look at the gates ourselves. And uh, yeah, so we're sticking to the larger format because that'll still be uh, more important. And there's really nowhere for us to go if we're starting to go more on the Super 35 route. There's not much more stock to be gained or anything like that. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, affordable lenses, again, I think they're already super affordable. We're, we're in the arena of Super 35 lenses actually, uh, price-wise, so yeah. Uh, okay, cool. We will go into this large format book. So large format cinematography definitely has made strides in the last three to four years. Um, but the first kind of really accepted and handheld and where you could kind of pick shutter speeds and it was a very reasonable camera to work with was Leica format, what they call kind of in the 20s and 30s. Um, lights, or they were called uh, Leica even back then. Um, it was made in Germany. Um, uh, it's a Barnack basically camera. Um, it's the, it was 36 by 24, which is what we call full frame now. And um, people started basically kind of coming up with larger, larger negatives. They would do that to kind of um, preserve grain, preserve contrast, or they started to shoot for billboards. Billboards got bigger. So you needed negatives that were bigger. So they went into large format. So kind of trying to instill the integrity and structure of the grain came more out of large format, came something called perspective control. So either shooting like models or architecture, definitely architecture like in a Julia Schulman or definitely fashion and kind of glamour shots with George Harrell you saw large format become more important where either a nose could disappear or ears could disappear on flat close-ups, um, which are more popular. Um, and you saw this portraiture look. So with like Hasselblad, Rolly, Mamiya, things like that, and even larger format, um, Linhoff, things like that, you would see this perspective control and that became really, really attractive to photographers. So the next page here is, Origins of full frame and large format photography. So when TV came out, theater owners got super scared that people were gonna just sit at home and watch TV, uh, kind of like today. <laughs> but what you didn't have back then with TV, it was, uh, it was a fixed 133 format. So everything that was produced for TV was 133. So what theaters started doing mm -hmm. and studios is they created what was called widescreen and CinemaScope and things like that. So um, what we're gonna do is stick to spherical, but there was CinemaScope, 20th Century Fox came out with that. Uh, the Robe was the first movie. 
they made anamorphic lenses, which were basically the old Baltar lenses, not super Baltars, but Baltars. Uh, they were very small lenses that went on Mitchell cameras. Uh, beautiful lenses. Um, what they would do is take those and put a front anamorphic on it, which was humongous and looked like a fishbowl. Um, and uh, they created an anamorphic image. So you would squeeze in the camera and de-squeeze in projection. Um, what you got from those kind of lenses were a lot of things when you shot close up, they called them mumps. Uh, the actors looked funny, there was breathing, there were different things. Um, but it was still a 240 or 235 or a very wide uh, aspect ratio that uh, kept the integrity of the um, negative. Didn't keep the integrity of the actual image or the spatial plane, uh, but it did keep the negative. So what Vista Vision is, was created by Paramount. So instead of doing a four perf vertical pull down on a film camera, on the Mitchell cameras and uh, early Airy cameras, what Paramount did was come up with VistaVision, which took eight perfs and put it horizontally through the film gate. Actually, sorry, that's wrong. They did, a, they, did, they did two systems. They did a vertical pull down eight perf and then horizontal came a little later. So incredibly good examples of VistaVision of how people would use it. Um, you see it in Vertigo, you see it in the searchers. John Ford did a couple VistaVision pictures. Alfred Hitchcock did, William Wyler did is, they got to start using the space and also perspective control. So a lot of the stuff you see in Monument uh, Valley and you know, all the uh, searchers uh, scenes and things like that, you see the full scope of how gorgeous this division can work. And then um, kind of what came as a kind of hybrid of everything to get even a bigger format and wider scope was super was either Super Panavision or Panavision 70. This was a spherical format where they were using a bigger negative and more perfs, uh, sometimes 15, sometimes 18, sometimes 14, depending on the gate and what they were doing. Um, and you see it like in Lawrence of Arabia. So you get these gorgeous, beautiful vistas, but you still get this compression in the frame. So compression becomes really important. And that's why people love anamorphic as well, because you get kind of, you get to see something compressed and um, your background becomes closer and the out of focus uh, area kind of has more compression to it. So 2001, Lawrence of Arabia, a lot of those movies, um, you see Panavis in 70 and you see exactly what it's doing and this perspective control you have. So the next thing is, uh, next page is coming into the 80s and 90s and the 2000s and how large format really became important. Um, so this division really became popular in the film days of the late 70s and early 80s, um, especially like things with Star Wars or title sequences or things where they would do two or three passes at the negative. So like, let's say they would shoot a miniature set and then they would shoot an effect shot and then they would shoot an overlay of maybe the stars or something from Star Wars. They needed a negative that um, had the integrity that could get passed through the gate three times and see light three times. So VistaVision was really important with that and Dijkstra kind of used it incredibly well. And uh, uh, on every Star Wars picture, uh, New Hope, uh, Return of the Jedi and Empire, VistaVision was used. Um, in fact, uh, when they started using VistaVision, they made a lot of improvements to the speed to it. Um, and uh, cinemat Cinematography Electronics, uh, another Los Angeles based company wonderful people you guys know them from um right what's what's their panatape called what's their rangefinder called michael what does larry make a light ranger uh, no no uh what does larry make what's the first thing oh, that oh, oh. uh airy Cine rips off <laughs> Cine Cine tape. Tape. okay yeah um so um before there was a cinetape Larry made something called the cinematography base. Um, if anyone in this world has ever used the Airy 2C, an Airy 3, a uh, VistaVision camera that was done correctly, it had the cinematography base on the bottom and that gave crystal, crystal speed to those cameras and really kind of made them incredibly uh, well formatted. So VistaVision started using that and the first one that used that they dubbed the Empire Cam. Um, they painted it all black, and uh, yeah, they used that for Empire. So that, effects that, that, were used. That crystal base was basically the ultimate modification of any camera. 
it every, made, everyone it made, had to have it. It made it made an Airy three viable. It made a two C viable. It made a three C viable. It made Vista Vision viable. It was, yeah. I I, I bet you have a few of them uh, yeah, in yeah. the back room. Yeah. So um, museum. yeah, museum. Museum. Yeah. And then uh, Airy made the seven sixty five. Um, that was great. A lot of kind of corporate stuff and larger format and things that would be used in say ride simulations would use that camera and effects. Um, a lot of wildlife, a lot of National Geographic, things would use that. And then like in the 2000s, you really saw filmmakers and obviously Chris Nolan with Dark Knight um, kind of, oh, we'll just go back to that frame so I can kind of compare something on Dark Knight, Lisa. Um, IMAX became really important and prevalent. Um, I remember when we started Dark Knight, uh, Warner Brothers told Chris that he could do, um, I think six or seven scenes with IMAX and that was it. Um, and one shot we did that kind of convinced, I guess, Warner Brothers was, uh, there's a shot of Christian on the cake top of the uh, Sears Tower. So the Sears Tower has a couple levels. The cake top is the top, 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 top level where they don't let anybody go. Um, <laughs> so they got Chris put Christian up there. He was cabled in, but he was on the very edge with his toes on the very edge. And it looked like he was standing over Gotham, which was Chicago back then. And we did a helicopter shot with a absolutely incredible, wonderful cinematographer called Hans. Um, and it's this shot where you kind of, you're coming off over uh, the skyline of Chicago and the sun ball kind of just went down. So it was a it's a cobalt blue sky. And we shot it in IMAX on a, a 110 mil uh, lens. Um, and what happens is we transition from panning and flying in a 360 around the um, city to the back of the Sears Tower to coming over and tilting up to seeing Christian in profile to flying into him and almost flying into a cowboy. I think the blades were pretty close over his head at one point, um, but they pasted down everything, uh, his mask, his hair, so you couldn't see the blades create any air. Um, and when Warner saw that shot in IMAX at the Navy Pier and Dailies, they were pretty convinced. And what convinced them is you have this incredible scope, but you have this headroom. So it creates this image of this first bank robbery scene where you get this gorgeous kind of look and concentration in the background. But when you see Heath in the foreground here with the mask, it becomes so prevalent who the main character is and who's driving the scene. And that was really important to uh, Chris and Wally and how they formulated the scene. So from there on, we kind of uh, were shooting IMAX all the time, which is a experience that leaves quite a bit to be desired. Um, that is almost a hundred pound camera. And when you have a very demanding director and demanding DP, not mean, but demanding, um, that want things to flow as quickly as uh, running around with a camcorder. It, it makes for a uh, arduous journey of 15 months. But uh, yeah, it was, um, the, all the beauty is up on the screen there. The whole thing's not shot in IMAX. Uh, the, the, we had four different formats. We shot IMAX, we shot some 15 perf, we shot some Panavision 65, we shot anamorphic Panavision and VistaVision and uh, for perf spherical for some stuff. So, uh, but the line share is IMAX Vista Vision and anamorphic for perf Panavision. Uh, I swear to God, this is almost over, guys. This is so boring. I know you, you hate. The, I'm sorry. We'll do it real quick. Next page. Um, okay, large format, full frame cinematography for digital. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone has kind of experienced one of these cameras on here yet, a Venice, a Monstro, an Alexa 65, a Airy LF or Mini LF. Um, watching Joker was a big eye-opening to seeing how Alexa 65 and the lenses I kind of worked on for that with uh, Larry kind of affected the image and what he wanted out of them. Um, and then, yeah, if any of you guys watch Joker, that's a good one to kind of see what large format does and how he used the breadth of that. Um, to create uh, the city around Joaquin and the environment around Joaquin and how you fo focus on Joaquin in an intimate kind of uh, 
way without being used as a grandiose way. You know, usually Alexa 65 is used for more grandiose kind of uh, projects, but Joker was very much a low budget kind of intimate portrait of a character and it's a great way to show it. Also, um, uh, do a Lipa music video. Larry shot uh, kind of really early on to uh, Don't Start Now is a great one to look at. Most of that is shot on 18 mil, uh, the prototype 18 mil classic master build. So great. All right. Um, last page. I hope to God, or I hope this is the last page. No, there's one more page. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when you go into large format and full frame, um, the optics now become the humongous, humongous priority. A lot of, uh, I guess I wouldn't say misinformation, I'd call it a lot of information with differing opinions, views, and data is out there. Um, not every lens just kind of covers large format because it's a 50 mil and pushes past the sensor and back focus. Nope. Um, the master builds are 100% designed for large format and full frame, and uh, that gives us uh, advantages and limitations. But we think we've kind of come to a good um, balance, and kind of we drew upon a lot of vintage stuff. Um, kind of when we designed and the look of these lenses, uh, I was locked in a box of doing nothing uh, post-1972 technology, which sounds absolutely logical but a lot of uh manufacturers don't think that way and i've had a great 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 stable of lenses and a collection to kind of look at and compare to and and formulate um optical paths based on those looks so that was important so the optics and lenses and how they fit large format is really super super um uh important the matt i will get to all your questions but matt's very pointed kind of comment on a 1966 vivitar 135 millimeter f 1.5 silver lens on the bottom there yeah good friends of duke close helped uh kind of modify the city mod with the focus on there um, we love that lens. That is a lens that there are less than probably 100 of on earth. Uh, creates a gorgeous image. It's a Vivitar lens. Vivitar created it for NASA in 1966 to shoot on 4x5 Hasselblad on the moon. So, um, yeah. Uh, great. Okay, we are going to look at some, some of the chat and questions and complaints here from people. Um, Cinetape, yes, of course, Steve Irwin, that was Cinetape. Uh, Larry came up with the first acceptable and most popularized uh, um, version of a Cinetape. Uh, Panavision had one called a Panatape. Airy came out with something called a, I don't know, Cinetape Airy German, blue instead of red, I'll call that. I never really used those. I only used the Cinetape or Panatape and even that was into the big help because I had a lot of soft shots. Um, SR2, yes. Uh, did the SR2 use a cinematography base, Michael? Yeah, the SR3 did away with it. Yeah, they had the implant. Yeah, that's right. Um, Airy 3 is probably the most popular. I bet you he sold, I say it's fair to say he sold 300 of those bases that are on Airy 3s. I'd say more, at least 1,500. Really? Okay, yeah. wow. Then, uh, then I don't, I don't know, know why he's not retired at this point yeah. or retired way back when. Um, okay, uh, Rod, Lucasfilm couldn't, couldn't get the emulsions they needed for blue screen on 65 to 70 millimeter film. That's when they went to VistaVision. Yeah, 35, Anamorphic didn't have the precision needed for the effects. Yeah, so yeah, so New Hope Star Wars 77 Sorry. is, anim is Panavision Anamorphic. And Empire is Panavision anamorphic, but the effects are all spherical Vista Vision. And then Return is why did they not want to do Return of the Jedi or Return of the Jedi in anamorphic? I don't know. Uh, Lucas was over it by then, but um, yes, um, the first one is anamorphic. That was a big thing for Lucas to go anamorphic, and then. Um, Empire was Peter Shashetsky, who's shot Panavision Anamorphic for many, 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 many years. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with Peter's work, he is probably one of the most underrated 
uh, cameramen and DPs and is absolutely, absolutely an incredibly gentle and wonderful human being. A great film if you guys want to see uh, what a lens does to an image. It's not a well-known film. It's called Shop Girl that he shot about 15 years ago. And uh, the most beautiful lens ever created is a Panavision Primo anamorphic 40 mil. It's uh, about 13 pounds. It's humongous, but it's, uh, he uses that lens on that film so incredibly well. It's uh, gorgeous. So yeah, same with Empire, uh, but Empire Strikes Back is mostly C series and B series. So yeah. Um, David, especially with the loss of a generation or three, I guess you're talking about the negative on Vista Vision. Yeah, you need a good uh, negative so you can pass it through a lot and that's just a bigger image. Diane, years of experience and love for the art of a parent and you are a great bank of information. <laughs> okay, I don't know, you don't know me well, Diane, so that I don't know if is a absolutely precise uh, comment, but if I tricked you, okay, great. Um, Paul, add on the side. Okay. Oh, yeah, great. That's a good link. Okay, thank you. Uh, what the name of the movie he said? I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you're talking about Shop Girl. Um, and I'll put that in. Yeah, there you go, Sean. Awesome. Yeah, Sean has seen it. Wonderful film. Um, and then Steve Irwin put a YouTube link for something. Hopefully it's appropriate, Steve. I hope. Yes, mm -hmm. it's the Shop Girl trailer. Okay. Um, there, thanks, thanks, thanks. Any other questions? All right, good. Thank God. Now you guys can stop hearing me talk. We can go to, who should, should we start with you, Bobby, and show the widen um, campaign you shot? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so Bobby Bukowski shot something with the master built. I guess you, this, was this last year you shot this? Just, yeah, just in the winter last year. Okay. Um, now, Zoom is sucks uh, to play videos, and that's my uh, disclaimer. And I can say Zoom sucks because we pay them the whatever monthly fee now. So Zoom, yes, you guys are absolutely terrible. It's wonderful that you have this service and we can do this, but the video playing out of there is god awful. So here we go, Lise, you wanna cue that sucker up? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Ah, yes, there we go. Can you make it uh, full screen? Yeah. Their advertising ideas are big. Awesome. Your executions are 360. Your media agnostic. And yet you find yourself in a deep, dark rut. <laughs> like some kind of bull person, undervalued, underpaid, or totally unappreciated. Enjoy your one of your awards, but none of them with enough clout to set you free. So you remain anonymous, clinging to the one thing you've got. Hope that you might one day find a better place. Somewhere with brilliant people who think brilliant thoughts and make brilliant work. All it would take is perhaps winning the right award. One that puts creativity above PR, above politics. Or maybe an Andy Award, say. That could really get you where you want to be. God, I love that spot, um, Bobby. So, I mean, well, we'll let Bobby talk about it, but you shot that spot for Wyden Kennedy. I don't know if. Anyone who doesn't know Wyden Kennedy, they're possibly the preeminent, if not one of the most important agencies in North America, possibly and outer regions. They do commercials for that one sneaker brand. What's that sneaker, that small sneaker brand, uh, Michael? They're in Portland, I think. Nike. Nike, yeah. Um, so the, they're so, actually the largest then, independent ad agency in the world, is from what I understand. And I remember we yeah. were in New York 
in March and we were in at Panavision and we were going up the elevator and I said something to Lisa, I go, oh, I saw the director, Wyden's in this uh, building. And then the executive director was behind me. She goes, yeah, we're in this building. We have the most space in this building. And she, and she go, and I said something to her. I'm like, oh, you guys are amazing. And she goes, you got to come into our Heineken room or whatever. Um, so that was fun. They're in the same uh, building on um, Varick uh, and as Panavision in New York. So tell us about working with Wyden in that commercial, Bobby. Well, I don't know that I'll talk much about why and they're great people, great producers, um, allow a lot of creative freedom. So um, that's what I like about them a lot. Um, but, you know, it was a small budget that we had there. We had one day to shoot it. And um, it was a director that I worked with um, previous to, uh, he made a short film. So he hired me just to do this promotional for, um, for the awards. Um, we had this um, basement, um, very dank basement in the um, southeast um, that uh, was filled with, half filled with water. So it was a really yucky but picturesque cinematic um, location. And, um, you know, the purpose of that location was to say that, you know, there's a guy been toiling away underground and then if he came up and just saw what was in front of him maybe he would be aspiring to achieve greater things um i like working with um practical light i'm i am i must say that um part of the reason that i used the master built was because michael actually recommended them and um and i went to the, his house and we looked at them and i liked it um since i knew a lot of it was going to be portraiture um, there is, um, th there's a quality to the contrast that is forgiving and beautiful on a face. Um, slight, I would say slightly lower contrast, which I think smooths out flesh tone really nice. And I, I think since most of my um, career I've shoot, I've shot um, narrative feature films, the portrait becomes a very important um, shot in, in the film. So I'm always looking for um, lenses, aspect ratio, format that most um, complements that. And I must say with the new large format um, lenses and format itself, it's, it's a really beautiful, harkens back to a nice medium format um, kind of look that Tim was talking about um, earlier. I must say, I also like, I've been going towards the 166 format a lot. Um, so, some people are a little too afraid of the 3.4 or, or the 2.3, but it seems like I can get um, 166 in there. And um, I'm just saying that because I feel like the more square the form, um, the aspect ratio becomes, obviously, the more dense of a um, portrait you get because you're not having all of this negative space around. So um, I, I like using these lenses and this format with a boxier um, aspect ratio. Um, a popular Kubrick format. Yeah, it's true, yeah. 166. So um, I, I'm liking um, this, this new um, large format a lot. I'm liking the drop off in, in, in the focus and it doesn't go as far as the anamorphic look, which I think when you've shot for 35 years of your life, you see things as trends. And frankly, I'm getting a little, um, I don't know, tired of the anamorphic look. I, we did it, we've done it for decades and it's just nice to have um, another um, tool in, in the box. Um, I shot all of that stuff down there with light bulbs. Um, I think, yeah, every one of the, the sources in that is, um, is, is no more than a hundred watt, watt light bulb. Um, so you're, the, like two, you're like 10 to 12 foot candles at, at the subject. Yeah, there's nothing there. We shot, his key light is his computer screen. And okay. um, the background, I just, put some, had the art director put some sockets in the walls 
just porcelain bare bulb sockets. And um, my trick for that a lot is that I use silver bottomed um, light bulbs. You can get silver dipped practical bulbs so that when you screw them into the wall, what's facing you is not a bare element, but it's the silver surface of, of the bulb and it allows the light to wash the wall, but not come out towards the lens. And um, I, I find those quite beautiful because they make a nice glow on the back wall, but it doesn't flare um, too much. If you don't want to, if you want to flare, then I always feel like a, a clear bulb does that really nicely. But we were shooting at 1.4. I, like, I love shooting wide open. I, I really like that um, shallow depth a lot. I just think, again, I'm always um, fighting for making the actor, the character, you know, come to the foreground and making everything else around the actor disappear, unless the surroundings become important narratively. Um, I like a portrait that has limited depth of field. Yeah, and then it's it, even with the one sig. I mean, you, there's the there's some frames that you have like the massive headroom. There's some it, you get to do so much fun stuff with it. And close up becomes totally different. Haircuts become different on one six six. Yeah, I'm not so enamored with haircuts too. That's another kind of. Yeah. it's funny how again you know how your your aesthetic evolves, and which is why I was saying I like that idea of, of a more square format because then you don't have to do this so much. You, yeah. you could fit the whole head in, you know. And anamorphic is very much about haircuts. Yeah. Or, I mean, depending or, on, yeah, you're a hair, it's a haircut in format. It, yeah, it's there, or if it's there, then there's a lot going on on either side because you're pulling back, so you're having a lot more going on on either side, and that's a question of whether you want to imbue that space around them with narrative material or not. You know, that's a discussion you have with the designer and the director. What camera did you shoot that spot on? Um, what did we use? I, I feel like a mini, Michael, right? I think it was a mini, yeah. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I, I believe it was, it was I can mini. tell you in a second. Um, and then, so your first forte into large format and LF was um, uh, the, uh, the last thing he wanted, the Netflix movie. Yeah, it was with Dee Rees and Dee was, um, it's a Joan Didion adaptation. And um, she was talking to me very much in the beginning about it being, uh, a, you know, a very subjective film about the protagonist and um, so she did say to me that the one shot that we would be using a lot would be a portrait of Anne Hathaway, um, played the, the main actor. And um, so that's when we said, oh, well, why don't you know, we look at the large format and, and how it, it handles bringing the subject in a place where it's, it predominates the frame. And then on that is when I started shooting 166 because she did want to shoot Two, two, three, and then she was like, ah, but I'm asking so many things from Netflix and maybe that's a battle we don't fight for. So at that point I suggested, well, we could shoot, you know, maybe we could get 166 over on them. And um, of course <laughs> we, we tested it and um, they were fine with it. There were a few of the scientists who told us that when it got screened in certain theaters, it might not be quite what we wanted, but that was a rarity. and frankly who's watching movies in theaters so yeah um, i don't know yeah it's i mean it, it's funny especially when you see it on tv screen and i guess the sides come in a little bit 166 i mean it's it's and but i mean a lot of the movie it's a personal film it's a character driven film 166 makes so much sense yeah and it's new i am for me i must say um it it's exciting as an as an artist to just try other things, you know, I, I, um, it, it forces you not to be complacent. And um, I, I like the idea. I mean, when we started shooting films digitally, I had had already a film career of 20 years. And I was so excited the first time I picked up a, an Alexa for uh, Oren Moverman's Rampart. And it was very early Alexa. I think we were one of the first films to shoot it. And um, 
it was just so beautiful to take that camera in the backseat of a car downtown LA and see what, you know, natural available light was doing for us. Um, and it got really exciting. It was just really exciting. I think like we've done with film, we are doing with digitally. Um, you know, when we were shooting emulsion, we were always looking for ways to mess up the emulsion, whether it was, you know, baking it or flashing it or pre-flashing it or flashing the negative or positive or, you know, um, even Panavision, I don't know, maybe you remember, Tim, they had a Pana... Pana flasher. Pana flasher that was actually... Vilmos Zygmunt, yeah, they made it for it? Vilmos Zygmunt. You know, that would, ex would flare, basically, would veil the, 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 the lens so that the, um, the shadows had, you know, got light scattered into them. I think you could pretty much do that. Basically, a lot of the shots that you just showed, Tim, were like when you have a, you know, a bright sky, it will veil the entire image sometimes a little bit and you don't need fill light because yeah. it will go, that veiling will open up the shadows. So, um, you know, I think you can do that naturally depending on a location. That's a really nice way to light, in fact, to shoot against a bright window and um, take the highlight to a place that's acceptable and just see what the, what the, light is doing to the lens and, and well how. God, you see that a lot in i mean i guess the guy who comes to my mind immediately with like when you say a window or daylight or overexposed and kind of just pushing it back through the negative negative is like haskell wexler and bound yeah. for glory Definitely. absolutely you see that coming home you absolutely see that um it's such a natural way to light you know it's it, it's just so he nice lit everything naturally he was everything was motivated and if it if it wasn't motivated, it was real. Yeah, he was also had such a strong, you know, foot in documentaries. So definitely he was using yeah. um, natural sources. I must say telling narrative, dramatic films, I, um, for me, the, the truth and the integrity of the source is something that I feel like keeps you in the story and doesn't um, bump and tell you, you know, oh, there's someone shining lights on, on, on an actor. So, um, yeah. yeah, look, there's place for, you know, fantastical lighting, as we know, in storytelling, but it's just that I shoot much more um, narrative kind of thing. So I'm always looking at, to place it in a place that feels um, authentically occupied by the character. So an audience accepts that truth a little bit. I better. see I see so much of that in Rampart. I mean it's just it's the, the the beginning scenes with you're just driving around with Woody. It's almost two minutes. He's all he's doing is driving around LA and I think you're static single on him in the passenger seat and he's driving, smoking, looking around, but you're you're seeing how he's reacting to the city without any dialogue. Yeah. You know, what becomes important when you're using natural um, occur, naturally occurring light available light is um, location scouting you know because um, that's since that's what's lighting you, you um, the subject you pick streets that that you like the overhead lights or maybe you're in a tunnel and you like the way the lights along the walls are, are working um, so to me scouting if you're using available light scouting becomes really really um, important and your relationship with the um, production designer obviously becomes really important because um, you're asking them to furnish the lamps that create whether it's direct light or diffused light or light that might point to a surface and bounce back from a surface so because your lighting instruments become the lampshades basically are they opaque? Yeah. Are they are, are they translucent? You know, um, that gives you the quality of the light that you're looking for. Um, light bulbs yeah, are, I mean, are great. Yeah, yesterday or uh, when was it? Or Wednesday we did a Zoom with Sal Tatino and he was just talking about his like so so important to be in sync with the production designer um, and just making sure. And I'm like, do you do you like for the production designer to 
put your practicals in. He's like, oh yeah, he's like, all the time. You know, it's like they'll come to me and they're like, look, we put we put sconces here, we put a table lamp here, we put this here for you, this here for you. We can start taking stuff away. And he's like, yeah, I just yeah. he goes, when I can start like taking stuff away, or when I can motivate, or no practicals are there, he goes, that's a huge thing for me. Um, and then we also touched on. And what you're kind of saying, Bobby, and I know obviously you're really familiar with him, and I know Eric has actually worked with him, but Sal came up under uh, uh, Harry Savitas, and he's like, you know, Harris's thing was always this wide open canvas. He, this, it's like this guy just never had a preconceived notion in his life when he went into a project, um, and uh, it served him so well. I go, there's no way on earth any person in not looking at the titles would know the same person shot Fincher's The Game and the, certain, the same person shot Gus's Elephant. There's no way. You did Elephant with those guys a little, right, Eric? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, on, on Elephant. Yeah, that was, Harris shot that. I was doing a bunch of time-lapse stuff on it. And uh, yeah, it was an interesting project. Wonderful project. And then how did your kind of relationship of just working with Gus obviously incredibly early on come on? <clears throat> um, what do you mean? You mean? A lot of people ask like about my private Idaho and you just, you guys working together for the first time. Um, well, you know, we did, we did a lot of projects together, you know, little projects together, um, super eight films and um, everything. And, um, when Idaho came on, it was um, it was sort of his chance to do. Well, he'd done Drugstore Cowboy, but when Idaho came on, uh, you know, shot in Portland, um, kind of Gus's, uh, you know, his stomping grounds. I mean, his favorite place to shoot. I don't know. You know, we were we were so young, and we just. Um, I mean, I was I was, you know, I've been carrying a Leica around my neck since uh, well since college when I could afford one, but I've had a camera around my neck for. When I was since I was 10 years old, so I was growing up and uh, developing pictures in my basement at that age. Um, but you know, shooting in Portland, we were away from everything, we were away from pretty much any authority figures. The studio would maybe come up one weekend and then go away. Um, so you know, we had complete freedom. It was a very formative time in my, my life because um, I wasn't used to. Um, I wasn't used to working with great actors and I wasn't used to shooting 35 millimeter film, which was kind of the, the, uh, the big step for me. It was sort of like, you know, becoming a grown up now. Um, and we just shot that so directly. So uh, just the way Gus works, he's very painterly. His images are very full of color and, and we, it was a very direct kind of shooting. You know, we'd line up a line up a scene. We'd cover a scene with maybe three angles maybe two, we just like, you know, overlap. And um, we never got in any kind of conventional um, coverage. So, you know, it was a great experience for me. And I never, I never got that thing where you're working with producers and you're having to get into the politics of filmmaking with groups and with um, people above the line. It was really like, a, I got to do my first film just with complete freedom. And I always just, you know, I mean, you're sub in subservience only to a director and his vision. It's not like, so anyway, that changed when I got older. I mean, you know, you get into larger films. <laughs> yeah, person. it changed real quick. Somebody, somebody, and then, somebody wants to look nice and they're very concerned about how they look. And, you know, you get into that quite quickly. Yeah. And then obviously those early days are not early days. We're talking mid eighties. Um, either you were Panavision or you were Aerie. That was like an Aerie show, right? So you guys were just like a BL three, BL two at the time and a set of super speeds and a zoom. Yeah, we shot that. Well, we shot that with a, um, we shot that with an Aerie BL. I think it was uh, Oppenheimer. Oh, wow. It was Oppenheimer. It's a BL four, I believe. Yeah. And Michael, you've got one. You've got the bill for, but it's um it's a great camera. It's a great one of the first great handheld, fairly silent. A little bit of noise comes out the front. <laughs> but um, you know, you're speaking about the two C. I've got a I've got a three C I've had for years, and uh they only made like 35 of them or 40 of them. And uh it had that cinematography base on it, but that was a tiny, tiny camera, you know. Really a wonderful camera with an orientable viewfinder. Um no, uh, not to get um, 
off subject, but uh, you know, the whole thing, I'll just go into your lenses. I, I haven't shot with them, but I've done a little bit of testing with them and I've, and I've been looking at them. And uh, I'm liking what they do and they are a good tool. And it's interesting now that we are into this large format. I think large format's gonna stay. And I think it's gonna be, um, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great um, narrative, um, you know, uh, format and it works. And it's interesting how it works like the whole 235 and how 235 has crept into um, dramatic films, um, smaller films, personal films. And it's just, it's a, there's sort of no rules. It used to be that that was supposed to be a big grand panoramic format, like you say, for all the, you know, the bigger movies. But it really works on a person, on a, on a close interior personality or psychological level. Um, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see how it's going. So, you know, we're going to have to be living with these lenses a lot because I think, I think we're going to continue to shoot television with it and films that are, that are streamed. And, uh, and I think your lenses are a good tool. They're, you know, they're very, they have a very unique personality and, and, um, what I'm seeing in the flares and what I'm seeing in the way, uh, you see veiling flare and you see those sort of little bubbly. Uh, those little bubbly round things that people are always trying to put in and post and especially in, especially in space movies. Um, I think it's, there's some cool stuff going on with that. And I think it's, uh, I think they're going to be a really good individual tool. I hope to use them, you know, soon on, on something. Yeah. That day at Sony, uh, the Sony imaging center. So I don't know if everyone doesn't know, Sony uh, has a imaging center in Glendale, California, which is uh, pretty much in Los Angeles. And it's an incredible, immense facility. They have every Sony camera. They have a screening room that has uh, a screen that the resolution and nit uh, count is beyond anything of any theater anywhere in the world. It's not a screen or a projector. It's basically hundreds of panels that are basically high resolution iPads. Um, and they have uh, that, to have it at like 50% or you'd have to wear sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. Or I you mean, get that's how bright it is. It's yeah. crazy. And we were there one day and did a huge presentation and Eric was there and he saw the soft flares for the first time. He shot the classics with the soft flares and he's like, yeah, gosh, I actually, I see a decided difference, but I see how they also mix in uh, tandem. So that was, a, that was great. That was a great, uh, to get his opinion and input on uh, on a lot of that stuff. And then, you know, talking about, you touched upon like talking with directors, Bobby, and I think a lot of people and talking to Michael earlier, I'm like, you know, how does he's like, well, how do we keep this interesting or whatever? And I know like talking lately, people want to just hear about DPs and directors and how they've been, they work with kind of a regular director or a new director. But I know both Bobby and Eric have worked with so many of, the same people throughout their careers. And I know definitely with Oren, Bobby, you've done so much. Uh, Brent, what was the last one with him? The Dinner, it was called. Oh, okay. Um, but we started, the fir first one was The Messenger and we shot on film. So um, that was maybe the last film I've shot uh, on film. Wow. Yeah. And that was 35? Yeah, 35 film. Um, we shot 185. Oh no, we shot anamorphic on that film. We shot super 35 flat lenses, um, one, one four zero. Oh, okay. Oh, you shot just flat two four zero. you extracted yeah, the negative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then Rampart, yeah, you can see it's early Alexa. And especially, I mean, you're cross-lighting a lot of it. A lot of it, there, there seems to be negative fill, if not even fill on some stuff. Yeah, there's, um, we were shooting S by S with, I think maybe that was the first time that camera was 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 used S by S because um, uh, we wanted to handhold the camera and you, we didn't want all this stuff. So we were, you know, Ari wasn't too keen on us shooting right off the bat with that um, with those cards because they they were still getting used to it. But Oren insisted us not to have any, you know, a recording an attachment to the camera because that camera was going to be in my hands and we didn't want any extra stuff. And we did great tests over at Photocam who, um, you know, helped us out with the film. Hmm. You know, Bobby, Bobby, you made a good point about the, um, about the available light and practical light. Um, this is what's cool about these uh, master belts is that they're a one four. I don't think there's any other lenses out there at that speed. Are there? 
Yeah, there's equivalents. The Supremes are one five. We're, we're definitely not in any kind of niche with that. You know, the Supremes are one five. There, there, there's lenses and there's vintage lenses that are out there. But um, yeah, one four is a nice is nice, especially when you have the balance of everything else. But there, there's definitely lenses out there that are equivalent in, in, in that range between either one three or one five. Uh, yeah. So we're definitely not unique in that aspect. Well, when we were shooting film, and Bobby, you're you're we're about the same age. When we were, you know, shooting a film, there was such a premium placed on uh, getting fast lenses. You know, when those first lenses came out, um, those first uh, air, area one fours, the super, super speeds. speeds. Yeah, they were so important because we were just trying to get a way to shoot uh, on location without using a lot of light lighting. And it's interesting now that we these cameras that we have right now, especially with the Sony um, 5000 ASA, you know, these cameras see light that our eyes don't see. We have that. We have the ability to not uh, need a super speed lens. You know, we can shoot a whole show at 2.8 or 4. But these lenses, what the, you know, what the, the aesthetic of a 1.4 lens and the drop off of focus, that's, that's the thing we keep going for, you know, and it also helps digital because it takes away the, you know, the copacetic cl clinical feeling of, uh, of digital. And I must say to add to what Eric is saying is that um, there, when we were shooting film, especially, you know, when I started we're shooting 100 ASA film and you're needing, you know, 100 foot candles for 2.8 and you need, it's, it's, it's a lot of light, you know, and, and so to me, um, just the weight of the production, of the lighting, of the gripping that um, we needed to not only get light, but to be safe and, and just so, you know, 100 pound lights wouldn't fall on people's heads. There, you know, there was a lot to consider. So the thing about digital photography for me that was so freeing was that we were able to give the set back to, or for a first time, give it to a director and give it to actors. And, you know, first time Woody Harrelson looked at me and said, you know, what's the turnaround gonna be? Cause he'd been shooting film all his life. What do you got, like 45 minutes an hour? I was like, five minutes, you know, like, um, and so that kind of psychology of being able to give more of the set to the storytelling than to the physicality of, lighting something you know so uh, especially when you're shooting low budget films because you don't have a um pre-rig crew and a pre-light crew so you're doing things set up to set up and when the instruments are big and heavy um it just takes time you know it's funny yeah it's um i would work you know from time to time you would get like a really seasoned ad or you know something and it, you know and i worked with a guy called gino and um he was Chris, Chris Nolan's AD. And he's like, you know, anytime, especially with IMAX and with like all the bullshit tech and like cameras and everything that's coming now on set these days, if you talk to any AD, you're like, oh, with digital, you're moving faster. And they're like, oh, are you kidding? Absolutely not. Everything has slowed down. Everyone has an opinion. Everybody's watching a monitor. Everybody has to stop for something. He goes, no, I would do a picture 25 years ago and we bang out seven to nine pages you know he goes it's 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 not faster definitely we've slowed down um but i think that it depends on the show it's the animal um if it's if it's more a predominantly character piece especially the way you work with people bobby and, and or and stuff like that it's just like how much can i primarily take all this time and focus towards the performance and the acting and the dialogue yeah, And if I have to take away from anything else, great. Where do I owe that? It's just to me, that's a question you, you pose to a director. It's like how, you know, here's the pie. How much of that pie do you see actually rolling the camera or do you want to roll a camera? And then that's up to you as a cinematographer to design the film in a way that the director wants to work. If the director wants, you know, oh, it's all about the visual. Okay, and, and you know, then I'm, I know I'm going to have a lot more time to tweak, to tweak and, and relight and stuff like that. But if, it, if director like Oren is telling me when the actors come in the room, I never want them to leave and I want them to get through the scene, um, then that's, it. you know, you approach it differently. So the approach is, is totally 
is, um, is di dictated by how a director wants to work. I think it's the most important question that you have to ask a director is how do you see, how do you work? How do you see a day going? We arrive on the set, what do you see? And it's a question that I always ask a director that I haven't worked with before is like, what is the protocol? Like, you know, what is your system? Because then you have to design in that way. Yeah. You know, um, we talked to uh, Sal Tatino about this uh, Wednesday, and I got to say, it's, uh, it depends on your age listening to this, and you can tell me if I'm way off and I'm an idiot. But I think definitely in the 90s, early 90s, when you and Eric were shooting music videos, and like Sal was doing music videos with Mark Pellington and Peter Kerr and all that stuff, I have to say that was the golden age, even, even with early hip hop videos. And rock and like alternative stuff and Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Sam Bayer and that kind of stuff. And you guys were doing it. And I know er obviously Eric with um, Red Hot Chili Peppers and the stuff with Gus and obviously Bobby with like the Pearl Jam stuff and Mark Pellington. Can you, can you, can you start off a little bit about talking about like the, do you agree that was the golden age of music video, Eric? Oh, and you oh, guys yeah. had no. No, it, it was. freedom? Well, I think it was the time when, uh, you know, music, well, music videos did not exist before when? Before what, MTV, really? 85, 86, where they were real, I guess. Yeah, so it was like, I mean, the thing about, uh, you know, there's a lot of carryover from uh, fashion photography and everything that was in, this, in the still world. But, yeah, it was a golden age because all these directors were kind of coming up and they were young and they were doing um, commercials. They were doing short things. So you, you got to use all these crazy tools. You know, you got to use these crazy lenses that were... Uh, I remember my, uh, Michelle Gondry. I still am trying to find out this lens. It's um, now I've got one of those old uh, DVDs about M Michelle Gondry's work, and um, there's a video. He did a lot of the Bork videos, and I yeah, mean, there's a lens in there. I can't figure out what it is. I gotta know though. It's just like the the I think it's done on black and white, shot wide open. But there's just these effects, like you're talking about the pets full and all that. Um, oh, it's a, it's a swing shift, I think. It's like a, a, one of those earlier well, swing shifts, no? Well, swing shift, you know, I mean, you were talking about pers uh, perspective, architectural perspective control. Yeah. That's where you take on a large format. You'd slide the lens off, you know, you keep the, you keep the stage and the film in the same plane, but you'd slide the lens up here. That was, arch that was perspective control. So all the building elements stayed straight up and down, even though you're pointing up at it. Um, yeah. But, but this, this lens, it wasn't a swing tilt where just, you know, you had one little plane of focus and everything else slid out. Or the plane of focus would slide through the, the front of your table with the lens would be in sharp, and then you'd be sharp, and then the back left corner of your room would be sharp, but everything else was out because you, you skewed the lens so that the, the, the field of focus sl slide through it that way, you know? Yeah. Mm. But yeah, all those, the yeah, the swing and tilt lenses, shift and tilt, whatever they call them. Um, yeah, a lot of that stuff. A lot of like, you know, lens baby, just a lot of taking anything, take a magnifying glass and put it on the camera if you can. I think I think it was a lens baby because that's around the time Yanu shot that skiing movie or butterfly, uh, what is it? Someone will know, something in the butterfly. And that was a lot of lens baby. Oh, the the... Bell, bell jar and the butterf butterfly? butterfly? Bell and the butterfly. That was a lot of lens, baby. And I think yeah. Michelle did that. Funny enough, after this, I go do a demo for uh, Michelle's two DPs that he uses now, Sean and Shasta. But I mean, that guy was groundbreaking. It's like he had this second wave, like him and Chris Cunningham and Spike, that yeah. they kind of pushed the boundary big time too with music videos. Yeah, great lenses, great everything. Yeah, but that was it was huge experimentation in those days, and it's uh, it's carried through, you know. But a huge music video for me, and I gotta think for almost anyone, it was so refreshing at the time. And you saw it on MTV five dozen times a day. Was Chili Peppers "Under the Bridge"? Is that literally you and Gus walking around downtown with a camera handheld? Yeah, that was pretty, that was pretty gorilla. I mean, we went all around, we went everywhere with the LA River, we were um, at that, that third street bus, red, old red bus line tunnel. It was yeah. Graffiti. yeah, that was pretty much just a, a camera and, you know, a couple, couple funny shots of, uh, <laughs> of Anthony uh, running in a 300 millimeter down the river. That was pretty crazy. There was yeah. a lot, there was, we sort of worked the, uh, but it was pretty much just us and the camera in a car, yeah. 
that and just a, natural light. That whole thing is just natural light. Well, there's stuff in the studio too, you know, the studio. Oh, the performance stuff, yeah. Yeah, uh, pretty much a natural light, yeah, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, we went downtown LA and just went through the, the part of LA, that, you know, on the nickel, you know, Fifth Street. Yeah. Where it gets a little dangerous sometimes. <laughs> um, we did all that, yeah. We were, uh, yeah, we were- And those aren't actors. Everybody in it is real people, right? Yeah, pretty much. You mean, oh yeah, yeah. Just except for the red hot chili peppers. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was good. Um, that was that was MCT, MTV's number one video of the year. Yeah. Got Is that over. 16 or 35? I think we shot 16, I think. That was all 16. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, Bobby, you did the long form uh, Pearl Jam music documentary uh is it 95 god is it that am i that old yeah it's 95 yeah. and that's all 16. yeah 16. um with pellington we had made some films together mark and i so he started taking as a favor started taking me on commercials and uh, music videos because we always had more time and more money um i guess that's the, the thing that always would always make my blood boil is how much money and how much resource we had to shoot commercials and um, and music videos as opposed to how much we didn't have to shoot films. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. And I mean, for people who don't know Mark Pellington, I mean, easily him and Sam Bayer probably created four of the most watched or controversial kind of music videos of the day. Jeremy. Tom shot Jeremy. That wasn't yeah. you. No. But but you see a lot of that style in single video theory. Mm -hmm. He was big on portraiture too, Mark. He had a really great way of just wanting to, you know, conveying emotions just with people's faces. And he would shoot a lot of portraiture in his, his stuff, you know. Um, I learned a lot from him. We wound up doing Arlington Road together and it was a really... I learned a lot on that film. I learned a lot about actors on that film because Tim Robbins and Jeff Bridges were the main actors. And it's amazing as a cinematographer, how much you learn um, from actors because you learn about their process and their process informs, again, how, um, how you create a space which allows them their process. Because personally, I think the most important element on a set is what's coming at, through those people's eyes and their bodies and their voices. And I will take backseat to actors every step of the way, every time, because ultimately, no matter what an image looks like, if there's something going on with an actor, the story is being told in a efficacious, emotional way. And um, hell with all the scenery and lighting and all that shit. It's just like, yeah, I was I was I was always amazed on uh, Idaho how uh, River Phoenix would uh, like attract his character. You know, it's like when I saw the film assembled, we shot it totally out of sequence, out of uh, out of order. <clears throat> but when the film came together, um, uh, he, you know, his character from the beginning, middle, end. I mean, he went through such a arc. And honestly, as we were shooting that movie, I never saw the arc. I just thought. I just saw somebody really, really under acting and subtly acting and, um, you know, I couldn't see his process, but it was so inside his head, you know, and it's probably not, I don't think it's something he even talks about, but it's just like a, it's something that goes on and, uh, and maybe, maybe it's intuitive, maybe it's completely natural to him, but, you know, plot points as we went through the film, I mean, his character had to go from here to there and I just was, uh, you know, it was in, invisible to me during the shooting of the film. It's amazing. It's funny, Eric, because I worked with him right before that. I mean, he, literally, it's when I met Gus. We were shooting in Seattle, and Gus was coming up to visit River because you guys were about to shoot Idaho. So we worked with him at the same time. It was a film called Dogfight that I did with him. Oh, yeah, Dogfight. Yeah. Gosh, that's an early one. That's kind of before he was River Phoenix. No, he had done... The Indiana Jones movie, I remember. Because, oh, he did three. Because they were like, don't cut all his hair off and make it a little blonde because that's, you know, like all that. That was what Warner Brothers wanted. There was Stand was, By Me, was that? Yeah. 
Oh, that's right. Yes. Stand by me was before that. Yeah. Gosh. But yeah, it's, you know, I mean, and then, um, um, talking about just the finishing off with like kind of talking directors and music videos. I forget what you did. What was the other one? Which Springsteen one did you do, Eric? Oh, 57 channels and nothing on. That's an, that is like a groundbreaking video. That look is so stylized. Yeah. That, that was, that was wonderful. That was a guy named Adam Bernstein who's uh, does a lot of TV. Um, great director. Yeah. Those are fun times. It's fun working with, uh, with uh, Bruce Springsteen too, because you know you don't get to see these guys until you're on set, and um, I mean the director usually has a conversation or maybe has a relationship with them. But you know in those days, a lot of directors, a lot of videos, you'd just meet, you'd meet a person. I'd literally meet him on the set, and uh, you know Springsteen had some, he had some, he had some pretty, he had road skin. He was really you know well worn in a great, he, you know handsome way, but. You know, there was sort of like I had to be careful about things on him. <laughs> I think he was worried about his baldness too at the time. <clears throat> the director, the director, uh, I guess uh, Bruce said to the director, he said, "Yeah, I'm, my hair is getting a little bit of thin," and he said, "I'm thinking about opening my own um, my own hair growth uh, salons." You know, and Adam said, "Well, you could call it. There's a there's a baldness on the edge of town." And, <laughs> I don't think Bruce laughed at that. He was sort of like, <laughs> he was serious. And that's mostly like you're lit by strobes on that kind of for a lot of the stuff or the TV. Well, we were projecting uh, a video image from a projector onto his face. So he's in the beam of the, of the video image. Mm. Okay. So it's not strobe at all. Right. There's a couple things where I was doing close-ups where, I got so close, I actually used a TV set to light his eyes. I mean, it was the only thing in his eyes was a TV set reflecting in his in his, eye, in his uh, cornea. Um, that was pretty good. We did some high speed. He shot a bullet through a TV and destroyed it. And there was a lot of kind of, uh, yeah. And there was a big Cadillac out in the desert. We did the, um, we did the Cadillac going through a wall of TV sets. Um, All practical? Yeah, what is that postcard from... Art Farm, I think it is. There's like a shot of a, an old Cadillac just flying through this wall of TV sets. And they're on fire, they explode. It was kind of a, a fun recreation. Hmm. Yeah, you're right, Bobby. We have all these budgets on those that we don't have on feature films. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then what are you working, what are you getting ready for now, Bobby, when hopefully things kind of get back to plus possibly rolling cameras? couple of things. I mean, Oren, uh, once everything shut down, we were about to uh, embark on a documentary uh, about Willie Nelson. Oh, wow. And, and um, yeah, and that was going to be really exciting. And uh, hopefully that will still um, come about. So that's it. And Oren also has a narrative, two narrative pieces that he wants to get going. Um, a good friend of mine, Patricia Arquette, is um, do, going to do her directorial debut, and it's a story um, that Ethan Hawke will star in. It's kind of a, um, based on a Hunter S. Thompson um, part of his life with a, um, a young woman who was um, ghost writing for him when he wasn't in such great shape. And um, that would, that's the one that would be shot in New Mexico. So, wow, she's going to be an incredible director. I yeah, mean, you're she's, talking yeah. 30 some odd years of working with the best directors. Yeah, she's, um, she's attracting a really amazing cast naturally. Um, I met her on a film called Ethan Frome about 28, 29 years ago, and we um, became really fast friends. And so um, she's quite a creative. She's a painter, actually, too. And um, she's quite creative. So we're spending a lot of time doing a lot of prep on the phone right now, just watching films together and imagery. And you're, a lot shooting, of, you're shooting New Mexico for New Mexico or you're for, shooting it for, for Aspen, um, oh, okay. for, for Colorado. Um, a lot of acid tripping going on in the film. So we're looking at ways to represent that Luckily, she and I had both done acid, so we 
have an idea. You can draw on good experience. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Bringing it back. Bringing it back. <laughs> what are you working on next, Derek? Future's open. I don't have anything I'm on now. I'm just reading scripts, so I'm not sure. Have you done any of these one-man band kind of little commercials or anything in this time? Yeah, well, I just did a, a day of a a day on a documentary. Well, one with Jan. That was um, yeah, that was that was good. Yeah, I, you know, we really have to settle this out. Like, how we're we gonna how we're we gonna go into this? You know, it's uh, it's really tricky. It's almost like the film industry is uh, is maybe it's the most difficult sort of working situation to let people get back into working close because you can't. I can't imagine doing feature films without being in, you know, with from close proximity to, you know, a dozen people at a time in a room, you know? Yeah. I mean, even a small film, even a, even a thing where, I mean, um, either that or everyone's gonna have to leave the set and everyone just go, you know, just the, the those who are needed go in and uh, it'll take a, take a lot more days to shoot a film than it used to, which might be good. You know, I think we, I think we work too hard and shoot films for too many hours a day anyway. So maybe, uh, maybe it'll even out the, the hours, you know? And you've seen that white paper, right, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I haven't, I haven't um, read the whole thing, but there's a lot of white papers out there. European yeah. white paper, American white paper, state to state, you know, Iceland. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas. You know, what I say is, it's like selling a house. You've got the person that's buying the house, the person that's selling the house, you've got the bank, you've got the inspector that has to write off on, you know, the inspection and it's got an oil tank and it's the same thing with the film industry. You know, all these smart people are moving in that direction. They all want to sell the house. It's just like, get it together and let's sell the fucking house and get back to work. That's what I say. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it'll be interesting just to see how, um, you know, any kind of social changes uh, always bring about changes in the form of art, you know? So I, I feel like um, I'm positive in, in the way that how will the time and the place where we are now, how it will translate to how we tell stories, you know? And I, I think every time a good shakeup comes, um, you can extract something positive and new and innovative, innovative from it, you know? So you think we'll we'll see you you think we'll see a different movement in possibly the way we capture images and the way they're actually on screen because of it. I think so. I mean, I even think you know because I shot this music video recently and, and it was just like me and a, and a grip and a focus puller, and um, I had a choice of a grip or, or or a gaffer, you know. And I was like, I'll take a grip because I have a bag full of light bulbs already. So. Um, you know, it was, um, it was really interesting. I, I must say, I mean, look, I'm a union guy and I believe that everybody needs work. And I think that will be the, the most difficult thing to work out is how, how do people survive and, and, and still maintain, you know, um, their jobs. But I must say my experience on a set is always um, more fruitful, the less people they are. And that doesn't mean less people involved in create in building it but i always love it when you're on the set itself behind closed doors and you're there with the actor and possibly the focus puller sometimes they're pulling remotely and a boom person and you're sh you're ready for 360 and there's something that really beautiful happens in that kind of intimacy so maybe that that part of the film like the sets will be more closed like when we do you know a love making scene for instance we close the sets and it's always so quiet and nice when we have those scenes because nobody is around and i like the idea of closed set um when you're actually filming it i think it um it gives the actors the idea that the place is theirs and it's not you know it doesn't belong to 30 people it belongs actually to their their characters so I don't know. So maybe, and, and stories get told differently when in that kind of intimacy. I, 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 they just do. Um, you're lighter on your feet. You're swinging around. The actors are, are in it. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe more of that will happen. That's how I work with Oren a lot. So it's a system that I really like. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's like you never take away from this that, you know, obviously it has its 
political consequences. It has its economical consequences or whatever. But I guess the film industry has always been affected by different things. Like when sound came around, you know, the movie, the, the camera stopped moving, you know, it was more static. And then um, lighter cam cameras came around and you see, saw handheld and you saw things. So yeah, I guess maybe yes. now where there's less or more limited kind of crew you can see a lot of cause and effect in it. Or like Eric is saying, you know, like, you know, maybe you need more time, but often what happens is that they say, no, this is the budget and you deal with how you allocate the time. And that might translate into, for instance, less shots in a scene. So less even, coverage. Yeah, so even that can become a, a change in style. Like how do we tell a story with um, restricted uh, amounts of setups that could be an ancil ancillary kind of um, you know uh, change that is made because we have the same amount of money but we have less time to do it in so solving those issues always yield a, a, an artistic merit I think you know you see that Eric too you see possibly more kind of not not just static shots but like holding on moments longer instead of like swinging a lens or p p punching in or doing a dolly shot or something. Yeah, maybe it'll simplify the storytelling, you know. I mean, it's always fun to do a shot that's a single, a plan séquence, you know, a single shot, a whole scene in a single shot. It's always fun, but it's risky because you can't edit it later. But um, no, I think this will this will lend itself, you know, the, the guys like Bobby and me who are used to working light on our feet and with, um, you know, especially people that come from the documentary world, people that can work uh, uh, with just a small, you know, microcosm that those will be, we're suited for this. That'll be the first work that'll be coming back. You know, one script I'm reading now is like, it's just like three people in the movie and you can tell, yeah, I think that's why they wrote that script. You know, it's like they're, it's gonna, there's certain kinds of production will lend itself to, um, recovering from this whole mess you know i think i hope so but yeah uh, yeah well one thing's true uh people they want content because they've been at home eating it for four months and probably watching the same stuff over and over so whenever the floodgates open be it this year or next year i, I think it's going to be an incredible kind of re renaissance and resurgence of just making content, everything, commercials, videos, corporate stuff, feature films, TV, short form, everything. Yeah, I'm surprised there isn't a film script that's just, it's just uh, webcams, you know, like, like, it's like the way Saturday Night Live was being done there. Yeah. Um, like you just do the whole movie, it's about that. But then, you know, I think we're going to get tired of that pretty soon. And I also think that um, the whole subject of COVID-19 is like not something we want to keep thinking about every second of our day. I don't think, you know, it's going to be a, you know, it's like they're saying that, you know, stop writing these scripts about COVID-19 because it's topical. It's not, people don't, that's not the entertainment or that's not, that's not the distraction we want us to go, you know, to re, to re-examine what we're going through now. It's, a, it's like it's too early, you know. Yeah, it's like people who almost don't even want to turn on the news. I know definitely with Bobby, he's just like, you know, I, I think you've been off Facebook for a little bit and stuff. It's like at some point you want to kind of control your own emotion. And it's like, why am I watching the news? It's just, it's, I, I get it. I want to be informed. But at the end of the day, I, I just, I, I want to, I want to put a bullet in my mouth after I watch an hour of news. It's, it's, it's just not... It, <laughs> delusional or not watching the news sometimes is just not a happy experience you know what I mean and I mean I think I think reflecting more on COVID people are just so ready to get away from this in one way or another but it's always what storytelling has been about isn't it like that you know for me the the best thing is to be for a movie to take me to a place whether it's an inner emotional place or an exterior journey journey Places that I don't know, that I'm unfamiliar with, that I'm not intimate, yeah. re, intimately related to, you know, and and there's a need for that. It's it's catharsis for uh, for human beings to be told stories, you know. So you know, it's funny because a lot of people, um, and I, I just watched this documentary on Spielberg, and people always kind of blamed. I don't know what the right word is, blamed him or kind of pointed to him as, oh, he's not. 
he's not he's not a serious filmmaker. He's not a Scorsese or whatever. And you know Spielberg's so unapolog unapologetic about it. He goes, you know what? People, there's a reason a theater is dark. There's a reason you walk into a place and there's curtains everywhere and no light from the outside world comes in is because people go to watch movies or films or whatever you want to call them to escape what they're doing on a Monday at seven o'clock. So, I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. And I think, you know, hopefully when we come out of this, it's like you just don't see movie after movie after movie about world apocalypse and, and, and COVID and stuff. And we can just get into telling a story, you know, about drug dealers and people killing each other for money. Feel good, feel good, easy, easy stuff. Yeah. I must say, Tim, a, a, a slight aside, um, your lenses are really pretty too. Just uh, architect. <laughs> Okay. Just architecturally, they're, 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 Thank nice, you. they're nice looking. As an aside, I'd like to say I really like the new hairstyle, too. <laughs> we'll see. COVID. It, no, it's, it's uh, aerodynamic. Yeah. So. Well, it's also just, I tried to cut it with a scissor, and then it got shorter and shorter oh. and shorter. <laughs> Eric, yours is longer than usual. Yeah, I'm starting to look like an old sea hag. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's not becoming. I know. Maybe I should do Bobby. Maybe I should just do the buzz cut. I don't know. Yeah, you could always wear a hat when you don't like it. You wear a hat. That's yeah, right. Exactly. If you're if you're ashamed, you put a hat on, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> it, it looks good on you though. I think it's I think it's a good move. Yeah. Thank you. Gosh, thank you for all the kind words. It's absolutely to have like two heroes that I studied for years and years before I could ever think of picking up a camera or being on a set or being a loader or being a focus puller. You and Eric are just so, I'm so flabbergasted that you like the lenses, you use the lenses, not only that, but just being able to talk to you and have a community where we kind of just share experiences and tell stories and stuff. I think it's important and I thank you and Michael so much for thank kind you. of bringing this thing together. It's, it's really been wonderful and even boring at times. I, I get it guys, but uh, yeah, any questions you have, please. It's not boring, uh, Tim. No? Okay. No, it's not boring. <laughs> <laughs> all right well, yeah, super fun you guys thanks so much thank great. you that was hey, really uh, really thank a fun you. discussion and you know the master belts and then bobby and eric on here pretty special um yeah. and so yeah we're still rolling on the lens summits as i was saying we're taking next week off july 4th weekend and then we're gonna have on the 10th we're gonna have uh, wolfgang from hawks gonna be on That'll be exciting. I haven't really seen a lot of presentations by them. So that's a little different. And he'll be hosting it from Germany. So uh, and then we uh, on the tail end of that, the next week, we'll have PS Technique with their new Technovision full frame anamorphics. Tokina on the 24th. Zero Optic on the craft of rehousing vintage lenses with Alex on the 31st of July. And then uh, I'm pretty sure we got Crozeal after that. So um, anyway, we're yeah, you know, Michael, I gotta, yeah, I got to say, Michael, it's so cool that you're doing these because um, I'm learning more in, uh, you know, it's funny, I'm learning more in uh, sitting in my house in like the last five weeks than when I'm in LA and I'm just trying to get to rental houses and look at new products. You know, it's really uh, super fun. Yeah, I like it. It's awesome. It's a good thing that's come out of this. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been uh, super fun. It's informative. So awesome. If you guys have any questions or anything, email Michael. I got you guys have his email. Email us uh, for anything. And uh, yeah, um, super happy to talk to Eric and Bobby and see everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Peace. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, guys. Have Thanks, a great Lisa. day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. It's always awkward leaving, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Michael. Happy birthday, Michael. I know it peeled his headphones off before we could say it. <laughs>